All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Fridays with Fiscal. Today's session, we're going to be covering um, adjustments using the uh, adjustments option under core. And we'll also be discussing miscellane miscellaneous payments as well. And we're going to cover a couple other adjustment options as well. Um, if anybody has questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you could put um, your question out in the chat. We're going to be watching that as well. Um, I'll remind everybody to please mute yourself. That way we don't get a lot of uh, feedback or uh, you know loud noise in the back. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started here. The first thing I want to talk about Let's hold on here. I want to make sure I'm recording right now. Yes, okay. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about are the adjustment options, which are under the core menu. If we go to the core and go to adjustments, the adjustments option has a wide array of adjustments that can be made for different types of situations. Um, as we, you can see when we get into it, there are several choices, several, several different ways that can be used. Um, we're going to pretty much touch on each one of the options just briefly. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about it, but we'll just touch over those briefly. So if anyone needs to create an adjustment, you have to go ahead and hit that create option tab. Once you do that, you're going to have, have, have to choose an employee, but the first thing I want to talk about before we do that is up in the top left corner, corner, can't say that, we have a create new or close option. And what that does is if I choose the create new option, what will happen is if I'm going in, let's just say that I have an employee who I know I have to make several adjustments to for a payroll item, okay, instead of it this this screen closing out every time after I hit the save option. If I have this create new option set, I can go in and I can choose my employee. So let me just find an employee. And obviously we'll go ahead and we'll start with payroll item. So once I've chosen or clicked on the payroll item, it's going to drop down everything, all the payroll items that this employee has associated with them. So let's just say that I need to go into the 591 and make an adjustment. I could do that. And then I can choose my type. So again, we're under payroll items right now. So I'm just gonna choose the change of the total gross. Maybe it's incorrect. So I'm gonna make the change. I, I use the transaction date option. Now, you've gotta keep in mind when you're using, entering in a transaction date, the transaction date has to be a date within the current, not the current, the open posting period. So let's just say right now, you can see over here, I'm in August. If I tried to go in and enter in, oh, let's see, 7 1 21, and maybe I want to add $50 for gross. I'm just going to quickly do this so you can see. Oh, it worked. Of course, it didn't give me an error for that. But there are there's a lot of uh, things that would be like your retirement and to, or your retirement days, hours, things like that that you have to be within the current period. Um, when you do like this, but I just said the payroll item, I could I could choose a different posting period for my transaction date and it worked because I'm just basically updating figures on the payroll item itself. So we're gonna go in and I'll go back and show you, well, shoot, I didn't show you what I wanted to show you. Let me go back and do that again because I wanted to show you how the create new option kept her pulled up. I'll just do a fringe benefit. All right. So when once I click save, you can see these fields blanked out. Now it allows me to oops. 
Oh, <laughs> hold on. I forgot to choose a different benefit, but I forgot to choose federal record. There we go. My system is running a little slow here. I can see that. All right, there we go. Now I save the item. You can see here, it took me back to the screen. Now, if I need to make another change to the federal tax, I could do that. Or if I wanted to change to a different payroll item, I could do that and make the adjustment. Now, if I chose the close option, come on. Okay. What's going to happen is once I make an adjustment, let's just go back here, federal record. So since I have the close set, once I click the save option, it's going to close that screen out. And then I would have to go back in and do another create. Like I said, there we go. Okay, so those are those. That's just kind of one thing I wanted to show you with the adjustments as far as the uh, close or create new. Now we're going to again go over each item a little bit and not in great detail, but just a little bit so you know what each of them is actually doing. Um, anytime you have anything as far as a payroll item, you have to make sure you choose the payroll item that you're going to make the adjustment to. So once you have your employee pulled up, again, you know, pull up which payroll item you're going to be adjusting. Now, when you choose federal, I'm, these are I'm going to talk about right now, but there are certain um, types that when you make those changes, as you could see earlier, I chose the fringe benefit option, but I didn't have a payroll item chosen. It gave me an error because the fringe benefit is on the federal record. So I have to make sure that I have the 001 record selected. So let's just talk briefly about each of these options that are available under the type. Okay. So the health insurance, which is the first option, is the cost of the employer sponsored health coverage. So an adjustment for health insurance does not override the amount that is basically out there already. So maybe it's a little different than classic because I think classic, you had to put in the full amount. In redesign, you're going to put in the amount that would basically make the, the health insurance amount be what it's supposed to be. So either you've got to do a, a, an addition, a positive figure, or you would enter in a negative to reduce that figure. That's how you're going to do it in the redesign. So you're pretty much basically only entering in the amount that wasn't tracked within the system. And you're, again, you have to use that 001 federal tax payroll item to enter a health insurance entry in. And then that health insurance information will be on the W-2 in box 12, and that would be coded as a, a C code. The next option is your moving expenses. And those that basically at this point don't really apply unless you have someone that's military because they changed that, I think a year or so ago to only include that for active military employees. So if you would happen to have an active military employee, you may end up using that moving expense option. And if you did, again, you'd still have to use the federal tax record to enter the moving expense dollar amount so that information gets put on the W-2. The next option we have are the taxable benefits. The taxable benefits, which in classic, if you're familiar with classic, were NC3 payments, if you, dip, if you process it through the payroll, or you could actually enter the tax benefit amount on the federal record using the adjustments. And when you uh, use that option, um, Lost my train of thought. Well, we're using this option, and I'm sorry, we're using this option in adjustments if the non taxable benefit, the non taxable benefits option was not used during the regular process of payroll. 
So if they forgot, they didn't do it, they want to do it at the end of the year, however they want to do it, this would be how they're going to actually be entering that using this option and adjustments. The fringe benefits option, it allows them again to enter fringe benefits on the federal tax record for W-2 reporting purposes. That would go like in um, box 14, I think on the W-2. And so you would enter the information for fringe benefits in here through adjustments as well on the federal record. The next option is the life insurance, which if you're, again, familiar with Classic, we use, there was an NC1 option that could be used during the regular processing of payroll. If for some reason that was not used, um, or maybe you found out late in the game um, and you didn't add it and it needs to be included on the W-2, the adjustments journal option would be where you would enter that information in. You, again, you would be using the federal tax record using the life insurance type, and then you'd be entering in your information for that life insurance payment through there. Um, one thing to keep in mind, uh, the W-2 report's gonna automatically adjust the federal, state, OSDI, and city taxes, and Medicare total and taxable gross. Um, and so basically no manual adjustments are needed for the gross and taxable gross. You're just entering in the, the withholding amount or the amount um, again, since you're doing this through adjustments, if you didn't process it through a payroll, because this figure that you're entering in is going to inflate the, the total and taxable gross for Medicare, Medicare taxes need to be paid because if you're not processing it through payroll, you have to pay that Medicare one way or another, or you're going to have problems when you process W-2s. So usually, um, the districts, a lot of times, because it's such a small amount, the districts will cover the Medicare amount for the employee and the employer. But if that's the case, you have to use adjustments to go in and enter the withholding amount for the employee. Even though the board may have paid it, you're going to use the withholding uh, amount uh, option for the employee and then the board amount option for the employer. Or if the board pays it out, maybe it's a pickup employee. You're going to use the uh, the pickup or the uh, the pickup amount, the pay by the board option. So that's that's one thing to keep in mind. We have all of that documented in our documentation as well, and we talk about it usually at the, at the end of the year at our year end meeting. Um, we have an adoption assistance. Uh, again, if adoption assistance type. Uh, pay type was not used during the payroll processing, you could use the adjustment and use that uh, adoption assistance type to make an adjustment uh, for that as well. Um, the amount, that amount gets put on, again, on the W-2 in box 12 with a code of T. And uh, the city is only adjusted when the payroll item configuration is set up for the city payroll item to uh, tax non-cash non earnings. So remember that uh, if the, the city is not set up to tax non-cash earnings, this will not get included on that uh, for the W-2 reporting. We have dependent care. And again, in the system, you have the capability of having a dependent care payroll item set up, but if the district does not or chooses not to have a payroll item set up for dependent care, they could use this adjustment journal and enter dependent care information in using uh, the, dependent, the dependent care type. Um, and the amount that you're going, they're going to basically add for dependent care is going to be added to the total and taxable gross fields uh, by any amount that's over $5,000, which is the threshold for dependent care. For, uh, and it will do that for any payroll item that taxes dependent care. So you're talking like your federal, your state, your again, your city, if it's applicable. And that's all uh, done. Uh, the totals will get in inflated for W-2 reporting purposes. And again, since we're talking about the dependent care and if they didn't have a payroll item set up, the federal deduction 
of the federal record would have to be used out of that dependent care information. We have a third party uh, sick pay. So this is basically, if the third party sick pay is taxable, the users will need to use a third party sick pay, uh, pay amount to, to, excuse me, to add the third party sick pay amount to the total of taxable gross on the federal record, the state, and the school district record as it's needed. So if there's school district, they would have to add it. Um, this, if we, if we use this third party option, this, this adjustment journal option, it's uh, going to cause the gross amount on the W-2 to appear higher. Um, if federal tax was withheld, so you're going to need to add, add an adjustment using the amount withheld uh, to record the federal tax withheld. So basically, if you get information from a third party vendor for third party information, this is what you're going to be using to add that information to inflate the information on your federal and your state. And then also, if there was withholding, you would need to add that information using adjustment journals as well for the third party pay. Um, if the third party pay is not taxable, um, you're going to add that amount using the third party pay to the federal tax record only. And that amount is going to get put on uh, box 12 with a code of J. So basically you would just be add or adding that information and that, that will show that it's non-taxable because you're only going to be adding the amount using this third party pay option. Again, all of this is documented in our documentation. And I'll show you the link to that after we're finished. We have a vehicle lease, which again, is still um, something that applies to the federal 001 record. Uh, the vehicle lease option adds the total and taxable gross field, adds the amount that you add to the vehicle lease to the total and taxable gross field on the federal and the state record uh, during the W-2 processing. Um, when they add this information, that will be reflected on the W-2 and uh, in box 14. And that is actually one of them that is the first one that appears. So no matter what, if districts choose to include other uh, payroll items, the vehicle lease information will always appear no matter what. So that's one of the things that's kind of like not mandatory, but it will actually just be showing automatically as, as the first, one of the first things in box 14. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about under the tech is the total gross. And again, the total gross is going to affect any payroll item that that employee has associated with them. Um, so an example is you did an employer error adjustment for a 691. Maybe you did the error adjustment because the 691 or you know 591 or whatever was missed on the last payroll. Okay, with that being said, since it was missed on the last payroll, the gross, an applicable gross for that pay were not included on the 450. Okay, because you missed it, the first pay, now you added up the second pay. The withholding amount will be correct on the records, but the, the total and taxable gross amount is not correct because that did not get included. So here's a, here is a scenario where you would have to add the total and taxable or applicable gross for that payment that you did the year adjustment to. So you could actually go in to the, find the employee, find the payroll item. So maybe you have to adjust the total gross and applicable gross on the 450 record. You would choose that, choose the total gross type, enter in your date, and then enter in the, enter in the dollar amount. So maybe um, that employee's gross wages for last pay was $2,000. You have to add $2,000 to inflate the total gross and the applicable gross on the 450, so it's reported correctly at the end of the fiscal year. 
And the same thing applies for your applicable grows. If you need to make an adjustment to the applicable grows, here's where you're going to do it. And remember, you can use a figure, you know, like I said, $2,000, I could put $2,000 in here. Maybe the figure is overinflated. I could go in and enter in a negative $2,000. It would actually reduce the amount on the applicable grows. We have an amount withheld. That's going to be the employee amount that was withheld for that particular payroll item. We have the board amount of the payroll item. So maybe the, the board pays a portion of an annuity and the employee pays a portion. Well, if you needed to make a change to a board amount, you're going to make use this board amount of payroll item option. I skipped applicable, applicable I cannot say that, applicable annuities. That actually is used to update. There's an applicable, applicable annuities that shows up on the W-2 report. That is used to update those figures on the W-2 report. Mm. Right, there's an earned income credit amount right now that is not currently being used. We have an additional withholding amount. So that will actually add uh, to the to date withholding fields for payroll items selected. So if you selected like a uh, you know, 500 record and use the additional withholding amount option, it's going to add the to date withholding uh, to those to date withholding fields. It's going to increase those by however much you put in there or decrease if you use a negative figure. The portion of fiscal to date board amount was earned as rehired retiree. Portion of fiscal to date board amount that was held as rehired, retired retiree. And the portion of fiscal to date gross that was earned as a rehired retiree. All three of, the, of these options are used for your, um, like your 400, 450s, 590, 591s. Uh, if for some reason, the district forgot to mark the employee as a rehired retiree. The retiree figures will not reflect what they earned as or what they paid as a rehired retiree. And a lot of times you find this when you're getting ready to do advance, the advance for the fiscal year. Uh, these fields, these adjustments can be used to correct those, those figures on those payroll items, on the retirement payroll items. <clears throat> uh, the ODJFS total gross, that's going to update the quarter day ODJFS wages on the ODJFS report. So if, they, yeah, if the district is processing the ODJFS report and for some reason the ODJFS wages are inaccurate, they're incorrect, they could use adjustments to correct or to update that the total grows on the report. <clears throat> and the ODJFS weeks will update the total number of weeks that it should appear on the ODJFS report. <clears throat> Remember on that, the transaction date has to be within an open posting period. If it's not, then an error is going to occur. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> The SCRS retirement days and retirement hours will do just as it says. Um, it will adjust the retirement days or retirement hours. Again, this is we've had a this has been a hot button topic because a lot of districts want to be able to process like Classic did. They were able to go in and do an adjustment for you know five days from two payrolls ago with no problem, and then report it on this payroll. Well. In redesign, it doesn't work like that. And the reason it doesn't is because we're following SCRS's rules, basically saying, okay, if we want to be reported, okay, they work, you know, these two weeks, this is the pay period, these are the number of days that they work. Um, and if, if you have other, other um, 
days or hours you have to report or whatever, you have to make an adjustment. Well, we've been getting a lot of pushback on that because of the days and hours. And the problem is we have to follow the SRS rules. Now, classic, again, it wasn't really, it was allowing you to do that, which it probably shouldn't have been. But in reality, SRS is wanting this. And I know uh, Mark has been in conversation with them. We're trying to see what we can do you know, to make it a little bit easier for the districts. But again, we have to follow their procedures and do what they tell us to do. So <clears throat> same thing for SRS, retirement days and hours. You could use those adjustments. And keep in mind, I should have said something. When we're doing all of these here, no payroll item needs to be selected because those really don't apply to a payroll item. Like the ODJFS, rows, weeks, hours, none of these do. Obviously, everything above that at that point did apply to payroll items, but these do not. Same thing is true for this EMIS attendance and EMIS absence. So if you have a district that calls and says, hey, you know, my uh, EMIS coordinator sent me a message said, this person is missing, you know, all their their attendance days for EMIS. The district could go in and use this EMIS attendance option and then enter in, you know, 100 days or whatever. Because it's just like classic when we did the adjustment for EMIS attendance or, or absences, you're just adding it here instead. So you could do it through the adjustment journal. Uh, we have the board pickup amount of annuity or of annuity, geez, of oh, payroll item. Got to get my verbiage straight here. Um, and that's basically your the board pickup amount. Like if you had a 691, how much they're picking up? A 690. If you may needed to make an adjustment to that, you could go in and choose that option and then enter in the dollar amount when you did that you could go in and look at, say, the 690 record or the 691, and you could see that the withholding for the board would be increased or decreased based on what you entered in here for the amount. <clears throat> the advanced sick leave use, um, that item is used if you want to reset an employee's advanced uh, units used on the core leave screen. So basically, um, if you have, a, let's just say that you have a district that does not um, allow, you know, the uh, advanced sick leaves, advanced sick leave units to be reduced when the district does uh, an accumulation. And so basically that employees, those amounts are just sitting there. You could actually use this advanced sick leave option to go in and you know do a negative, maybe you have maybe the employee has five advanced days. You can go in and enter a negative five days. And then once you did that, it would update that employee's record. Let me go in. I'll kind of show you that real quick. Kind of went through that a little bit too fast. Let's just find somebody here. Um, let's just choose Aaron here. Come on. There we go. Okay. So right now you can see Erin Blackwell. She has five days sitting there. Advanced use. Okay. And say my district is not using the option where they those days can actually be reduced by accumulations. I want to clear this figure out. I can do that by using the adjustments option. If I go into adjustments and I can find Erin Blackwell and do a create. I choose Aaron. I'm just going to go down here and choose this advanced sick leave. Today's date. I'm going to put in a negative five. I'm just going to save that. 
All right, now I should be able to go back to leaves and her five advanced six leave days should be re back to zero now. There. And it's back to zero. So that's how you can use uh, ad ad adjustments to update the uh, advanced sick leave. And then there's one more option under the adjustments that we can go to. And that is the health, whoops, I went too fast. The health reimbursement. And I still didn't click on it. Or you have two messages in the chat too. So the health Oh, okay, hold on. Is there a workaround for this issue? Marge, can you can you uh yeah, Lori, elaborate um, on what the question is? Yeah, it's the same question that the second one is, is so how do we report that substitute um, or employee for SIRS or STIRS that is without the pay range? Like, like how gotcha. do you advise the districts to to do that reporting? Um, Cause they're angry about that little um, issue. Are they using the additions option? Uh, not using that we're aware of. Do you think that okay. that's the way it should be done? Yeah, I, I would say because if their period begin, like if they're basically, they're being paid, but they're being paid for time, you know, two weeks ago, they really should be using additions and using the dates that they're actually paying them for. Because it sounds like to me, the district is using, they want to use dates from, let's say, two weeks prior or whatever three four weeks prior yes but they want to pay them on this payroll if yes. that's the case they should be using additions using the dates that they're actually paying them for they can pay them on this pay date but they'll have to use different beginning and ending dates using additions that gotcha. would be my suggestion that would be the best way to handle that thank you Lori. brenda does that answer does that help yeah, no problem. And Lori, can I jump in here? This is Eric from Connect. I, I'm I'm because I'm working with Margie on kind of the same problem. Sure. Again, one of the issues, again, particularly the issue I think we're thinking of mm -hmm. is a situation where people are turning in timesheets, you know, months after the work is done. So again, I mean, we still I, I understand what you're saying, but the suggestion then is you set up a pay period then for a span of three or four months even just to get those dates in there. Is that what you'd recommend? Well, according to how SDRS works, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that that's basically what they're saying. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the word. And the worst, the worst thing about it is you're having to set up the pay period. You have to do it in ESERS as well as doing it through here or through the payroll. But that's really the only way you can get them reported correctly. I mean, the only other option, Eric, would be for them to actually go written directly into eServe and manually enter the information. Oh, you know, heaven have forbid. To pay them. You can't have to do that. Yeah, heaven I forbid. know. And especially if you have hundreds of employees, you don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it, it is a very, it's, it's a big hassle. It's a very big problem. I, know, I, just but, I mean, wanna... that's the only other way I can see for them to be able to do it. I thought that, I mean, that sounds right. Go ahead. Suggested, but I kind of just wanted to wanted to just hear it speak <laughs> to verify that was the right way to go. Yeah, I mean that's that's really the only way I can see for them to be able to do it and have, like you said, I mean either that or the district cracks down on the employees and says, hey, you know, if your timesheets aren't in here by this date, you aren't getting paid. You know, the, the districts may have to you know, kind of hunker down on the, the employees a little bit too. If they're, mm -hmm. you know, turning them in two, three months late, because by then the, that, that, that's really a, it's more of a hassle for the, pay, the payroll person at that point then. I agree with that, yes. <laughs> well, thank so, you. Yeah, yeah, I do too. <laughs> Lori. Yeah. So, so yeah, we yeah, need to okay. tell them to go to STRS or SERS and set up another pay period for that that payday. Correct. Okay. 
Correct. Yeah, that, that would be my suggestion, Brenda, because that way they can use additions and they can actually go in and they can process the initial payroll. Then, and then they're using the way we have it set up now, processing the regular payroll, pulling those pay groups in, and then just entering in particular days for those, but those maybe the sub pay groups and using different days for them. That way you're you're getting those timesheets included in this payroll with those dates. That's the only way I can see that it, it'll work. Okay, well, she was using the additions and then um, she was still having to make the changes in ESERS or STRS. I'm not sure which one because her subs are all it different. Probably be S, it'd probably be SERS because STRS doesn't usually have a problem mm, with the, okay. anything as far as attendance because that usually doesn't happen until the end of the fiscal year. It's more than likely my guess is SERS because they have been giving districts, it's a, it's a, it's a hassle. But it's just the way they're reporting and, you know, we had to make that concession to allow how they want it. And I mean, unless districts call them and say, hey, we don't want to do it like this, but they're going to push back and say, no, this is the way we're doing it. You got to do it like this, because that's pretty much what we've been told. I know we've talked to them on multiple occasions and have been told, you know, that if they, they work it, work the, you know, these days we want it reported, you know, as such. So if you're, you know, you've got the, the addition set up for this date to this date, and then they're getting paid here, it should, it should process correctly because you included those, you know, in, in the payroll that you're processing, but those dates are included the beginning and ending dates of the additions. So it should be able to, they should be able to accept it, especially if it's set up on the ESER side with those period being and ending dates with that pay date. It should be, they should be able to, to handle that. Okay, I think we were missing the ESERs part. That Let's could be. There. Okay, that thank you. Be. Yeah, yeah, because my guess is probably what happened is on the file when they sent it, it's probably saying, hey, you know, you have these dates in here, that doesn't match what we have set up, you know, on our side. So it's, it's throwing probably a, an error. That would be my guess. Okay, and then the last thing on the adjustment journal is the health reimbursement. And that uh, item is used to report the total amount of permitted benefits under a qualified small employer health reimbursement arrangement. And that's put in like box 12 with the code of two Fs, FF. Um, that's gonna allow uh, eligible employers to pay uh, or reimburse medical care expenses of eligible employees after the employee provides a proof of coverage to the employee or to the employer. So the eligible employers are basically those with small, uh, small business, it's small groups of people. So maybe like uh, less than 50 employees. So. Pretty much most of your school districts aren't even going to qualify for this unless it's like a community school and they have less than 50 um, full-time equivalent employees, then this would may affect them. But again, there, there are certain criteria that they even have to meet. They have to be employees who work like 130 hours a month or 30 or more uh, hours a week. And so there's like a lot of um, restraints. Uh, and again, this would only apply to those particular districts, but we do have that health reimbursement option available out there. And um, if, you, if they need to use it, they would be using that. And I do believe that affects that, the federal record as well. I believe it has to be used for them, I think. Yeah, it does. You'd have to use the federal record, payroll item record for that health reimbursement type, just like we do those other ones that we talked about at the beginning, like vehicle lease, um, taxable benefits, et cetera. Uh, we talked about the transaction date. And like I said, most of the time, especially if it's anything related to retirement day, retirement hours, ODGFS week, things like that, the transaction date has to be a date within the current 
open posting period. If, if it doesn't like it, it's going to tell you, it'll error out and tell you, hey, posting period is not open, you can't use that. Then we have the dollar amount. Again, you can use a regular positive figure or you can enter in a negative figure if you need to increase or decrease. Uh, there's a description option, which a lot of districts choose to use that just because that way, if they want to go back eventually and look at the adjustment screen, the adjustment journal screen, they can look and see why they made this change, you know, maybe refund a, de refund of a deduction, you know, adjustment to make uh, gross correct, you know, things like that. They can just make a little notes so they have a, an idea of why they made the change. And then we have these today options, which basically um, for sure will affect anything you make changes uh, to as far as payroll items, because we have your month to date fields, quarter to date, year to date, and your fiscal year to date fields. So if you make any changes, you want to make sure, you know, if you only want to make a change, maybe, maybe you're just making a change to a year to date total. You want to make sure you uncheck all these other options, because if you don't, and you're adding a dollar amount here, and these are all checked, it's going to increase every single one of those not just the one you want, it'll increase all of them. So you have to make sure you specify to the to date options. Okay, any questions on the adjustment screen itself? And the nice thing about the adjustment screen is, uh, is you could actually run a report from here. So maybe I wanted to look, look for an employee and see all the adjustments that were made for that employee. I could go in and I can filter my information or maybe, you know, you could, well, that didn't work. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, maybe I just want Vicki. I could go in here and I could pull in all the fields that I want to show. You know, maybe I wanted to filter it by a certain date. I can do that. But I could then go in, once I got all my uh, filter information here, I could go in and create a report for the information on this, on the adjustment journal. Now, if I wanted to make an, you know, I made all these changes, maybe I made 15 different changes to this employee on the same day. I could go in here, you know, if I had all these different fields pulled up, maybe I want to have the uh, payroll item code showing as well. I could do that by going into the configuration and choosing the code option. That way, if I wanted to filter down, maybe I wanted to only look at adjustments that I made for a particular payroll item, I could do that. And I could run a report on it. So basically you can use that to filter, find information for an employee. You can run a report, pretty similar to a lot of the other screens that we have out there. It's pretty nice. Um, the next adjustment option we're going to be talking about are the outstanding payables. And um, in outstanding payables, let me go ahead and go to the outstanding payables. Several things can be done. Okay, so I'm just going to go into the payables by payroll item. I like to, I like that view. That's my choice. That's my view I like. So I want to find the 011 payroll item, okay? And it should just give me anybody that's paid into that item. So you can see here, I've got two employees that have paid into this item. All right, let's just say that I haven't processed out any payables, as you can see, but Jordan Conway, he should not be paying this payroll item. You know, the, the company called and said, yeah, hey, Take him off. He shouldn't be paying $13.92. You're like, oh, well, I already ran payroll. Darn it. I already got him on the list there to pay, uh, to create a check for the, the company. Well, what the district can do is they could go in to the payroll item itself for Jordan Conway. So we'll do that. Maybe. Okay, I'm gonna find him. And the 011 payroll item. So I'm just gonna go in and do an error adjustment. 
because I basically want to give him a refund of that 1392. So I went in and did a negative 1392 error adjustment here. Okay, save it. <coughs> then I'm going to, going to go in and refund him the money. Sorry, my system is a little slow this morning. So I'll just go into the payroll item refund and refund him that $13.92. So here he is. I'm just gonna refund the selected payroll item. I'm gonna do a check. All right. Now, when I go back to my outstanding pay payables, Oh, somebody is not muted. There we go. Okay. Um, so let me go back to outstanding payables. And then we'll go back and find that 011 payroll item. And you can see now that 1392 is gone. So when I process by outstanding payable for this deduction, it's only going to process $12.20. You can see the 1220 shows up over here. So that basically means I got rid of Jordan Conway off of my payables. So I don't want him on the check. And I also refunded him that, that money as well. Okay, another thing that we can do in outstanding payables. Um, if we went in, let's just say, oops, hold on here. All right, I'm going to go in and void. Hold on, let me pull up a, let me pull up a, uh, let's see if I have another payroll item sitting out there. Maybe. Come on. There we go. Okay. So we can see I have a 550 sitting out here already. And the total dollar amount is 1927.26. Okay. But let's just say that I had to go in to the payee. I had to void a check for this payee for the 550. I'm so sorry, my system is just like so slow. Okay, so right here, we've got a 550. Oh, let me find one that's a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to void that. Maybe. Again, I think it's my internet connections. It's just a little bit slow today. I guess it's because it's Friday, right? All right, I'm gonna confirm, avoid. Okay, now if I went back to my outstanding payables, You can see, since I voided that check, look at my total dollar amount now. It actually put all that money from that check back into my outstanding payables. It put everything back into outstanding payables at that point. So if I need, needed to make a correction to somebody, I could do that. You know, I voided the full check, and maybe let's just say that Shauna Evans, she shouldn't have paid you 2084. Okay. Maybe she only should have paid 12084. 
All right. So I have to take $100 off of that. Well, I'm going to, I could, I'll run the, do a process of refund for sure. But let's just say overall, we want to make a correction here. We could do that by using this payable adjustment screen. I want to make a correction to this dollar amount. I could do that using payable adjustments, or I could have just um, voided the check. It would have been out here. I could offset everybody and you know make this zero dollar or zero it out, which I probably don't want to do, but. Anytime you void a payee, it's always going to put it back in here into the outstanding payables. Now, one other thing I was going to show you is let's just say, I'm going to find an employee here. Let's just say that you had an employee who the company sent you the money for the employee, $25. Said, hey, give this $25 back to the employee. You shouldn't have paid it. So you did that. You gave him the $25 back. But in reality, he's the only one that pays this payroll item, okay? He's the only one. Don't have anybody else to offset figures, whatever. Well, in reality, since they gave you the money back already, you wouldn't want to short the check for the company anyway. Say that somebody else did pay into this. You don't want to short that check. So you're going to actually have to make an offsetting entry, an adjustment entry to get rid of this negative $25 because you already have the money. The company sent you the money already. So it's already covered. And you don't want to short the check the next time if there's other people paying it. So what we would do is go into the payables adjustment option. Maybe. And we're going to do a create. And then we're going to create a record for Crosby. Because he's the one that we gave the refund to. Or she. He or she. And this was for, what was it? 609. And then because there's a negative $25 sitting out there, I have to do an offsetting entry of 25. To offset that refund. So once I save that, I should be able to go back in to that 609 record here and see the amount now is, is showing as zero which is what we want because we didn't want that negative $25 sitting out there, whether it be, you know, maybe on the next payroll if other people paid this, um, that would, may have been covered and it would have shorted the check. We don't want that. So we, we reduced that and got rid of that. Is there any, any questions on the outstanding payables adjustments? Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about are the compensation adjustments. We have an option on compensations where you can actually go in and make adjustments. And a lot of times, I know uh, that fiscal year end, like at the uh, advanced time, SDR's advanced time, uh, some districts called and said, hey, you know, this person's day's work doesn't match the work days. Well, this would be a way that they could correct that. So I'm going to go in and show you where those compensation adjustment options are at. Okay. So if you look at the bottom of your screen on compensations, you'll see a compensation adjustment option. If you hit create, you can see the options that are available to make adjustments to. We've got amount paid, amount earned, amount docked. And this is a non-contract. That's why work days are not on here. You can see that this is a non-contract compensation. 
So if I wanted to make an adjustment to show the amount paid, I could do that. Add the adjustment and then the amount paid field on that non-contract compensation is increased by $500 to the amount paid. All right, now let me find a contract. Here we go, use this one. And you will see on the contract that the, con the compensation adjustments options, oh, come on, there we go. Have a few more options. You're paid, you're earned, your doc, but also your pays paid and days worked as well. Those can be adjusted as well. And again, this comes in handy for some reason, maybe an employee, <clears throat> uh, maybe it was an employee that started late and for some reason they set her up incorrectly and the contract days worked are not matching the contract work days for an STRS employee, so they're not advancing. This is a way that they can actually go in and make those days match. So if I wanted to make her days match her work days, I could go in and enter the 260, because you can see right now her contract days work shows zero. Her, day, her contract work days is 260. But if I wanted to match in order to maybe get her on the advance, I could go in and add the day's work of 260. Then it should update on the compensation record Maybe, there we go. And now you can see I have days work 260. So this is another way adjustments can be used through compensation. So we have adjustment journal, which uses a, a, a wide array of things to make adjustments to. We have compensation adjustments. We have outstanding payables adjustments. So there's a lot of different places where you can make those adjustments. Um, one other thing we're gonna briefly go over are uh, the options for miscellaneous payments to be entered. Uh, those payments could be entered through current. So if the district initialized the payroll and they wanted to enter a mis like miscellaneous payments for employees, maybe teachers that worked extra hours or days or whatever, they can enter that information in through current. The nice thing about redesign is since they entered it through current, if for some reason they had to delete the payroll, they could use the delete payroll option, not delete payroll and, um, oh, I can't think of the name, but exceptions that they added. If they don't choose that, just the delete payroll, anything they added in current, as far as those miscellaneous payments, should go into future. So if they reinitialize the payroll, it'll all pull back in. That'll save them having to manually hand enter all that information in again. Not a good practice yeah. used, but I mean, it will help. It will Lori, do that. Yes. Is that, we had a couple districts. Is that been updated? Because we had a couple districts that had that situation and it didn't do that. So, oh. Roxanne, do you know, did they add a miscellaneous payment to someone that was already initialized and pulled in, or did they actually add an employee into current? I don't know that answer. Because if they <laughs> added the employee into, yeah, we have found, I think we found that uh, if someone added an employee into current and then they deleted, that person did not pull back into future, which I believe we have a ticket out there to correct that if, okay. if we can, if it's, so, if it's doable. But so just so if, there, if there's an employee that was initialized, go ahead. No, sorry. sorry. I was just going to say, it's just so I'm clear. So if they, if they get added after it's initialized to current, they don't go to future. But if they were already initialized and they added something that's like a miscellaneous, that would go to future at that point. Correct. That is correct. That's how it should be working at this point. Um, and like I said, we someone discovered that they had added an employee after they had initialized, they added an employee in, and then for some reason they had to delete. Well, they said, well, hey, that person didn't come back in. They didn't go to future. We're looking into that. But if the per if they initialized the payroll and they went into, you know, John Smith, who came in on the initialization, entered some 
miscellaneous overtime, whatever they entered in for payments, and they had to delete that payroll for some reason. They went out and that that all that information that they had manually entered should have been in future. Then when they reinitialized, it would have pulled back in. Make sense, Roxana? Yes, thank you. Yep, no problem. No problem. Um, let's see, we talked about current. And then obviously future. Um, that's usually the way a lot of districts go. They enter the data in future, and then they can report, you know, future reports and make sure they're, the data they entered is correct. And then again, if they had entered data in the future, they initialized the payroll, and for some reason they deleted it, that data would, should go back out to future. And then when they reinitialize, it should pull back in again. That data should be there. Um, one thing we are working on, we've had a lot of questions, a lot of, of requests as far as the pay account information in future, because when you go in to enter in a specific miscellaneous account for an entry you're adding in future, it shows every expenditure account that's available to use. And districts do not like that. They want to be able to actually see like, like Classic does, just the accounts that are associated with that particular employee. And I know we have a ticket out there with a request on it. And um, I think we're gonna to try to get through that as soon as we possibly can, because that's been uh, something that's really, <clears throat> excuse me, really been asked for a lot. So we're definitely trying to work on that. Lori? Um, oh, a few, a couple of release. Yes. Go ahead, Marge. Um, sorry, Mary. Yes. Um, couple questions oh, I'm sorry <laughs> or suggestions that uh, we've got districts who we can't seem to get their current um, contract to pull up when they're entering future pay to be the first in the first position um, uh -huh. I, I don't know if this is the place to ask it but if anyone has any suggestions we've tried making them primary we've tried archiving them and uh, I just we just can't get the order right for our districts. March, are these contract uh, are they contract compensation stretch paid with work days on them? Yes, you, they are. Okay. Um, we I, I won't go into it because I actually I'm going to have to see it. Send me the information as far as absolutely what it is. Yeah, <coughs> thank you. We'll look thank at you. it. Yep, no problem. Mary, did you have a question? I'm sorry. Okay, we're good. Um, a couple a re release or two ago, we released the uh, mass load option where you can actually load data into future. And this is not the same as. We have the attendance absence import, which is very similar to USB import and classic. Um, it's not the same because you cannot load attendance. This is strictly just future information. And you can add the future pay amount information, but you there are certain required fields on the CSV file. You have to have the ID, needs to be loaded. To in the load file with no value entered to, to actually add a future record. So if you're adding a future record, you have to have ID column, nothing in the column it has to be blank. You have to have an employee number, position number, and the compensation compensation code. And then obviously the pay information as well. If you wanted to update record that you already have in future, you could do that as well. Now, with that being said, the ID field has to have the string of numbers that's associated with that entry in future. And that column header can be found under the more option. So if you're in future and you choose more and choose ID, it'll actually show you, it's like a long string of numbers for the ID that would have to be included on that CSV file if you're making a change to a record that's already out in future. And again, if you're updating those records in future, the ID is required, employee number, position number, and the compensation code. 
And again, out in our documentation, we have all the other fields that are available for loading as well. So you can see that information too. Uh, so keep in mind that for the attendance absence load import, which you can enter future data, that has a strict uh, formatting that you have to use. Um, it's like uh, record A or rec column A is a record type, B is the employee ID. All of those are specified. And even if, even if you're not using that column, you don't have any data in it, the column still has to be on the CSV in order for it to import correctly. If it is not, it will not import correctly. That's just something to keep in mind. Does anybody have questions on future current mass loading options that we have available? Um, hold on, there is a... Okay, there's a, a chat out here. Okay. If you have to adjust the amount with help for a payroll item under core adjustment, you would also need to adjust the total and type applicable gross. If the payment item is a section 125, you would have to make a bunch of adjustments. Is it possible to have the system automatically create the total and applicable gross adjustments for all applicable payroll items if you make an adjustment to the amount with help? It does this if you process a payroll item refund. So, um, Leah, are you talking about a particular adjustment? Because there's a, uh, I'm trying to think of one. The, uh, the non-cash earnings. When you make that adjustment to the federal record, it adjusts state, every, it adjusts everything. But you're saying like if you made an adjustment to section 125, I see what you're saying. You want it to be able to adjust everything. Is that is that correct, Leah? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. I can hear you. Yeah. So, like, if you let's say someone entered the rate incorrectly, like transposed a number for like health insurance, and you had to go back and fix that amount withheld, you would have to adjust the total and applicable gross not only for that payroll item, but for every other payroll item that that section 125 total affects like taxes. So, um, and it's kind of really cumbersome to think through like the applicable gross. Did, Leah, did they do a refund of the deduction? Did they process a refund for that or an error adjustment? Because if they did, all of that should get updated when they process the payroll. But an error adjustment still only adjusts the amount withheld, not the total and applicable gross. Correct. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. So if, if the system um, could I can, automatically I can, create I, those, it would simplify things greatly. Yeah. I will. I'll bring that up to, uh, to uh, at our next sprint meeting. Let me. Uh, okay. Thank you. Copy your thing here. Yeah. I will definitely bring that up because that that's a good that's a good question. But I don't know. I it's easy for me to say, oh yeah, that's great. But the program rules will say, yeah, that's a lot more complicated than you think it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I will definitely bring that up. I will Thank definitely you. bring that up. Yep, no problem. Anybody else have anything that they would like to ask or share? Okay. Well, I think that's everything I have. I appreciate everybody tuning in and bearing with my slow internet connection today. And uh, everybody have a great weekend and hope to see you soon. Thank see you, Lori. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.